Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 SLED IT and Security Leaders Virtual Forum. I would like to introduce our first session and speaker, Mr. Charles Mims, the AVP of IT at Columbia Southern University, who will be delivering a presentation on maintaining your customer experience amidst the great rearrangement. We've saved um, ample time for Q&A at the end, so please submit your questions in the Q&A feature below, and Charles will get them towards the end of the presentation. Uh, Charles, without further ado, I'll let you take the reins. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Sean. As he mentioned, I'm the AVP of IT at Columbia Southern University, and so like you guys, I'd like to attend events, see what other people are doing, understand other people's techniques and tricks. I don't think that I'm the only person that has ideas, and so really want to get get feedback and hear from you guys on, on, what, on what you see, you guys and ladies. And so uh, with that said, we're going to get started here. Uh, the first slide here we're going to talk about is, is who am I, right? So uh, I work for Columbia Southern University. We're a fully online private institution with about 30,000 active students. That number is a little lower uh, today. The COVID and the economy and other things have, have impacted us, like, like I'm sure all of you, uh, to some extent. Uh, we focus in large part on military, fire, law enforcement style degrees, uh, and, and, and a focus that's where our, our main uh, you know, customer base is, but we also have lots of students in, in business and, and plenty of other degrees there. We do a custom development in-house. We actually have our own homegrown CRM, uh, SIS, if you're, if you're in the education uh, industry. Uh, and then we do a lot of also, we do a lot of COPS implementations of, of software packages that we need to use for, you know, financial aid or, or other processes like that. Uh, you also see Waldorf University on here. So Columbia Southern is part of the Columbia Southern Education Group. And that parent company owns Waldorf University. I get the distinct privilege of also serving as their chief um, not chief information officer, but their, their chief IT representative. So I don't have a formal title other than the one I already carry at CSU, but in that role, I, I report directly to the president and I handle uh, both online and residential IT for that campus. It's a smaller school, there's about 4,000 students between online and, and residential students. And so uh, that's a neat challenge for a school that's up in Iowa. It's a liberal arts school, but we have, you know, go Warriors with football team. We have all the things. So lots of fun. So that's that's who I work for. That's who Columbia Southern and Waldorf University are. I've spent over 20 years in IT. I've got a little bit of a background there. So you can see I spent about 10 years in the United States Marine Corps. I was a radio repairman by MOS, uh, by, by job title. I also did lots of radio operations. So I was with the Force Reconnaissance Community. It's ground um, ground-based infantry. And so what that meant was I didn't do a lot of time repairing things. I did a lot of times uh, spinning radio watch and, and, and taking uh, calls. And so that's that's my background there. I spent about eight years in the commercial software sector at a couple different companies. Uh, the first one was a company called CTS America. We did law enforcement software. So I was an implementations engineer there. So I spent a lot of time going out and doing implementations of, of their software. So if you're not familiar with them, what do they do? They do 911 dispatch software, they do ticket writing software. So when I was there, uh, you know, you didn't get printed tickets that were typed up on a computer in your car. If you recall, I think sure all of us do, used to get typed ticket or written tickets, right? And so uh, we were one of the sort of pioneers in that space, uh, coming out with that technology and figuring out how to implement uh, mobile ticket books through the computer. A lot of fun times there, a lot of uh, work with local and state-based law enforcement agencies. Uh, so I got a lot of a lot of deep experience there, and then from there I moved to App River, who does online hosted exchange and also spam filtering. And so some of you may have heard of them, you may be familiar with them. And so that was like a SaaS product. And so um, I, I point that out because I think it's it was an interesting opportunity when Sean asked me if I was interested to speak to this crowd because you know I, I work for a private university, and so you know I sometimes feel like we're maybe a little different in the sled space. But I do think that my background in both the military working with uh, state and local government agencies, and then the SAS background gives me a lot of uh, unique perspective. And so as you can see, for the last 13 years, I've been in higher, uh, higher ed with Columbia Southern and, and Waldorf. And so I've seen a, a lot of different gamuts there. And one of the things I've seen throughout my time and in higher ed is the things that we implemented at CSU were things that me and my staff brought in from the commercial sector. And obviously they're not the same, they're not exactly the same, but we wanted to bring some of the same techniques in and some of the same focuses. And I think what I've heard over time when I presented at other locations or when I've had employees come in is, 
I haven't seen this before, or we haven't done it this way. And sometimes they value that and sometimes they don't. So, you know, I wanted to share what I've seen. And, and like I say, get a lot of feedback from you guys. You'll notice my last bullet there. I do have five children, so they keep me busy. Four boys, and then we finally had a girl and we called it quits. Uh, that's that's what I do it for, right? That's why I get up. So before we go any further, as I mentioned, I want to kind of get a, a feel for, for who's here and, and, and let us understand each other. And so I just have a couple kickoff questions. Uh, I'm going to try to format them in a way that makes it easy for you to respond in chat. And I'll ask if you will, it'll help us with our engagement so we all get to know each other better. So the first question I have is, if you would, if you could just type in the chat, what percentage of your enterprise products are you running in the cloud <laughs> the girl's name is Quits. That's right. That's exactly right. So she's, I, I tried, I tried to pull a uh, George Foreman and name them all Charles and my daughter, Charlie, but, but that didn't, that didn't, that didn't fly. So uh, only one Charles in the bunch. Uh, if you would, um, if you, would you please list in the chat, what percentage of your enterprise products are cloud hosted today? So I'll say for us, it's right around 35%, but I think in the next year or so, we'll be at about 50 to 60%. So that's where we're at. I see a 50 and I see a five. And I will say that's, that's not surprising, right? We're all in a different spot. A lot of 30s, 40s, 20s. Okay. So yeah, that, that's not surprising to me. Um, and, and I think that's a great question because at least you know, my experience, I just went to a sync event a few weeks ago. If you haven't been to one of their in-person events, they're great. Uh, it, but one of the things I heard I heard a lot of, of vendors speak and, you know, it's, it's very easy to hear everybody's in the cloud, everything's in the cloud. And it's not true for me. It doesn't look like it's true for you guys. And so that's not, it's not all that surprising. Next question I'd like to ask is how many of you are utilizing VMware or if you're using another platform that's similar, if you would just kind of throw that in the chat, you know, yes, yes, we are. No, we're not. So we got some yeses again, not surprising. One no, two no's. Uh, not surprising. I think a lot of people are using virtualization, so no surprise there. Uh, it's, I think it's more more common than not at this point. Uh, so that's that's again not not a surprise at all. What about in-house development staffs? Who has an in-house development staff? Software developers is what I'm referring to, uh, in, in on site that's actually doing development for you today. Again, okay, we got a couple couple small. We have a couple software developers. Couple knows. None of these answers are surprising me. Hopefully, we're all kind of getting close to each other. Not really very small. That's totally understandable, Paul. As I mentioned, we built our student information systems, what it's called. If you're not in the education space, it's a CRM equivalent. Don't, don't, don't yell at me if you are in education. You go, that's not quite it. I, I think it's, it generally catches the idea. It's how we're measuring our students, tracking them, making sure we record, you know, did they get their degree? What class are they in? All of those things that are separate from the classroom is basically what that is. And so that's what we utilize, the primary thing we utilize our software development team for. Uh, the last one I'll ask is, uh, who is currently dealing with recruiters poaching their staff members today? I will raise my hand. Yes, I am. Yep, yep, yes. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> oh Jim Suin. I, I don't I don't want any trouble with Jim. I'm not taking any of your employees, Jim. Don't worry. So uh Tim's lucky. He doesn't have anybody taking his employees. So that's that's good. Uh, or maybe maybe they just haven't brought it to you yet. We'll we'll see. So the reason I asked the questions I did, it is frustrating, yes. And the reason I asked the questions I did is what you're gonna see is when we talked, uh, me and Sean before this event, and, and I and I thought about what what's Where's my passion and, and, and what do I feel like I bring the most to the table on? It was around how do we still deliver the right product to our customer? And I, obviously, if you're not in the education space and you're more on the government side, well, your customer can sometimes, it's a, it's a weird phrasing of it because the citizens, right? And so, so what does that mean? And how do we, how do we, how do we refocus on that? And so that's, that's where my passion is, and in particular with employees. And so that's what we're going to cover today. And we're going to talk through a couple different areas that, that encompass these questions. And so I think you'll see that. And hopefully you'll find this useful. And like I say, please feel free to add in the chat ideas, situations that you've had around that. So, you know, with that in mind, the first thing we're going to cover is plan A. How, how do we uh, make sure that our customers have a great experience. Well, it's easy, right? They've got five bullet points here. We just need to be fully compliant with every sort of regulation that's required all the time. We need five nines up time. We need to always use the, the industry leading vendors and systems. 
And we need to have perfect DevSecOps. I know you all have that because I've been to conferences and I've heard vendors speak and they tell me that everybody has this perfect combination of Dev, Sec, and Ops. And they're perfectly flowing out with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So I'm sure like me, you guys are all there, right? And we just got to hire and retain and, and you know a complete staff and they're all going to be all-stars. It's, it's easy, right? Yeah, if, if you're like me, this is what it looks like more on more days than not. That That just doesn't work. Uh, and so, okay, so then what are we going to do and how are we going to get as close to those things as possible? So we've got three areas today. The first one we're going to talk about is availability and making sure that our systems are up and online, right? So I got a couple bullet points there right across the top, ADA, Title IX, GAP, PCI, GLBA. I'll, I'll stop reading them and, you know, if you, you know, I'll give you a minute to pause and calm down because if you're like me, those terms bring a lot of stress. I got to do them. I got to focus on them. I got to put time into them. But although those things are important and they're all important, absolutely. We are recorded today. I want you to know that no, under no circumstances do I think that those aren't actually important things for us to do. But I also know that for many of my customers, what's most important to them is, is my site online? And can they get to it? And can they do what they need to do? And so you'll see my first bullet point there. Well, who's my customer? And so that, that, that I find is often a challenge. It's very easy, particularly, you know, we're IT professionals. It's very easy for IT professionals to get focused on what they're trying to do and forget who their customer is. So we put a lot of time in. I put a lot of time with my staff on focusing and reminding them we actually have two customers, right? We have our internal customer, but we have our external customer. And you're going to see, we're going to play this out a little bit more later, is how do we actually address their needs? These things up top are important for the institution to, to just do business. They're table stakes, but, but there's much more than that. And so you'll see I've got monitoring down there. The reason I have that there, I can kind of skip the words on the screen, but uh, there's, there's several reasons for that, right? So if you, if you aren't familiar with these statistics, you probably are, but I'm going to read them to you anyway. Uh, Google's done a lot of research. And so in a moment, I'll show you a slide with some of that on there. But what Google's found is when your response time goes from one to three seconds, you're going to get a bounce rate of 32%. So if you're not familiar with that term, it simply means people aren't going to wait, they're going to leave, and they're not going to come back. That's what that means. That's pretty bad. But when you go from one to five seconds, it's actually over a 90% bounce rate. And that's, that's terrible. Now, it, it can be interesting in how that plays out with a school, for example, because, well, that may be true on my website when someone's first looking at us, but, but what, how does that play out when they're actually a student? And so I'm going to be totally transparent with you. I wish I had some amazing set of numbers to say, well, what we found is if our course takes, you know, 10 seconds to load instead of five, this is our percentage, but I don't have those numbers, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize that if those numbers are true for Google, it's certainly true for me that the slower my systems respond, the less students I'm going to retain. It, it's just a reality, particularly in an online environment. But, but any of us that are hosting services, we need to make sure they're online, they're available, and they're, and they're performing quickly. And so I've got several different systems there that can do monitoring. I will share with you that we use PRTG as a system and we monitor our services internally 100% of the time, every server we own, I can tell you exactly how much CPU is using. I can tell you how much memory it's using. I can tell you where the disk is and what the growth rate is. And so we're doing proactive monitoring there. I want to know if this system's going to go offline long before it does. And so that's how we train our system administrators and our software engineers is we want to make sure that the system never goes offline that you're responsible for. And we continually add monitoring to make sure that that's the case. Then we want to take it to another level, uh, because how do we know what our what our students are seeing or our potential students, right, our prospects? And so, well, we do that with another system, and we actually run real user monitoring. If that's not a term you're familiar with, that's okay. Um, it's It's been out in the market for quite a while, but uh, it's something we implemented, and monitoring is absolutely crucial to business continuity. I, I totally agree, and yet, like I say, we, we brought in multiple employees who were unprepared for the level of monitoring we do. And I've actually presented on monitoring before. And every time I've done so, people say, I, I, 
I didn't I didn't even realize that or we're not doing that that way. And so I really want to take a few minutes to emphasize this because this is where you know if you're actually available. And I, and I think particularly for smaller agencies, my experience with like local law enforcement, for example, is it's just not something they had resources to do easily and without someone pointing to them to some easy resources. It just wasn't going to happen. But resources like Pingdom, you notice I noted external, Pingdom, Uptrends, Logic Monitor, these are all services that if you don't have a large staff or your small organization, they're extremely cost effective, and yet you can get real-time monitoring of your systems to see what are my users seeing? What are my customers seeing? Is the site loading? Is it loading quickly? Is it is it failing to load sometimes and from where? And that's critical to making sure you're available. So. So I just want to really emphasize that there. I also want to emphasize proactive maintenance. And so that might sound like a sort of an interesting term, but, um, but what's in the next release of that software that's critical for you? Is it important for you to take it? When is it coming? Is, are these questions that you're asking your admins or that you're expecting them to bring you back answers to? Because if you're not, I really want to encourage you to do so. One of the things that this does is not just tell you about software. The second question there, what do our users need, begins to tie this right back to who is our customer, right? So who is our customer? Well, we have internal customers too. So by asking that question, what's in that next release? What do our users need? I continually draw my admins and my software engineers, my help desk, I draw their eyes back to what do our customers need? Who are we here to serve? We're not here to keep a server online for the sake of saying it's online. And those people aren't here to bother us and make us have a, a tough day. They're here because they're meeting the needs of whoever our ultimate customer is. And so we wanna make sure that we're actually meeting their needs and it's our job. It's my job, it's your job, and it's our employees' jobs to make sure that we're actually getting answers and solutions that meet their needs. So that's an important part of availability, obviously, because we need the features there. I'll give you one more stat here as I move on to a second slide uh, that, that references what I showed with you about Google. This is, this is publicly available information on their site, so you're welcome to go look at it at any point you want. Uh, but, but the Akamai actually recognizes and I apologize, but I'm going to have to just pull up my notes here because I don't quite have it quite right. But Akamai, if you're not familiar with them, they're a content delivery network. A lot of large companies use, use them to make sure that their content's available worldwide. They actually estimate that 9% of your customers that experience an outage on your site will permanently abandon it and never come back. Now, does that apply to my local DMV here in Florida? Probably not, right? But, but it darn sure is going to increase my frustration level, and it's going to increase the likelihood that I have to go in, that I have to go see the DMV, that I'm aggravated when I get there, that our employees have a bad day because they're dealing with frustrated customers. And, and, and that simple example there, I want to clarify, is something that, that I work on with my staff because it's easy to not see that. It's easy to not recognize that keeping my website up today means that everybody has a better time tomorrow. And, and that piece there is where my customer experience really gets hit, right? It's not enough just to have it on, online most of the time. I can have it online all the time. It doesn't matter that, you know, maybe if I'm in a local government agency that, that they don't have another option, it's still frustrating and it's frustrating for staff. And so we wanna make sure we do better than that, right? And so those are some ways that I think we can do that. Those are some tools. I, I put the tools on the slide, but what I would encourage you to look at is there's a couple ways that you can actually make sure your systems are available. Again, you can have internal server monitoring and you should do that. You can prevent outages by simply knowing, do I have enough disk space? I would encourage you to look at external monitoring. It's not enough to know that the server's online if users can't get to it. And there are plenty of reasons that can happen. And I would encourage you to look at doing real user monitoring, actually logging in, running through your systems to see how is the user experience. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a situation where our system's online and I've got a check externally that goes to the site and says, yep, it's there. But when you actually try to log in and use the system, We've got a database issue happening and the system's gone from, oh, normally I can get through all of these actions in 10 seconds, say navigate through 20 pages, but today it takes me 30 seconds or longer. So the question was, what external monitoring do you recommend? So there's a couple different tools we've used. Currently, we utilize Uptrends as our primary external monitoring tool. 
Um, I, I didn't make that choice myself, but my staff did, and I have a lot of faith in them as, as, as to pick those tools. And so I would recommend checking them out. They're good tools, very cost effective. Um, we've also used Alert Site in the past. I love Alert Site, but they are more expensive, and they're they're more for the what I what I call the real user monitoring or synthetic user monitoring, where it actually goes through and actually logs through your site. But these tools will actually allow you to say not just it ran slower. But which page out of the 10 pages did you navigate through that actually ran slower and why? Was it an image that didn't load? Was there an error with a script on the page? What's actually happening? Now, obviously, to get that information and to, to use it, you're going to have to devote some resources to it. It's going to have to be important enough to you that you dedicate hours to it in your staff. But if you do that, what you will find is I no longer need to have Joe down at the front desk call me and say, hey, users are calling saying the system's down. I no longer, my help desk doesn't have to tell me that. We do not depend on our help desk to tell us when our systems are down. They depend on us to tell them when it's down because we'll know before the users do nine times out of 10. And so- And Charles, Danny asked, you know, what external monitoring do you recommend? Right, so, so, so as I say, we use Uptrends primarily for our external monitoring tool today. Alert site's a good tool if you wanted to use that synthetic monitoring and going through transactions, Uptrends can do it as well. Uh, there's a couple others. If, you, if you're a very small organization, Pingdom is, is quite cheap and, and does the job well to just get some basic information about your site. So those are the ones I listed on the slide there and I would recommend looking into those. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any that they're using currently that they would highly recommend, but yep, Alert Site's a, a terrific tool. Uh, and so if you, if you have any others that you're using today, I'd highly recommend and suggest you, know, you put those in the chat there. But, but I, wanna, I wanna encourage you to really look at these tools as your opportunity to know the answers before the user and to get the answers quickly, proactively. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll make sure as we as we move to questions, I'll add some of those uh, links if I can in the chat or make sure that you get them because I don't know that I have the links readily available. I should have. So this is the first area and I, and I can't stress enough how big availability is. And my experience tells me that it, it it's easy to lose sight of in our industry. And so although it may seem obvious, I'm not sure that it always is. So the next one, and, and, and I, I, this was not intentional, but I love that it happened, Sean. So I know Veeam, you said, was the sponsor for the event. I titled this slide, What Would Veeam Do? And so I got my, my keywords here, again, that, that, uh, that scare me sometimes, you know, cloud natives, CICD, DevSecOps, right? These are all the big terms I always hear. And I go, whew, my heart's beating when I go somewhere, you know, I, we, we're not doing all that. We're not doing it as well as somebody else. And then, then I ask the questions like we asked earlier and we go, wait a minute. Wait a minute, nobody else is doing all that either, or at least not, not, my, not my peers, you know, possibly, you know, the guy at CloudBees. That's actually what I had on here initially was what would CloudBees do? I just, just heard a great session from them. If you're not familiar with them, they seem like a very, very good company. I'm not a customer, so I can't speak to that, but um, yep, ping them. They're great. They're a great one, Tim. Uh, and so, uh, but he, he spoke a lot. He spoke at length about continuous integration and five minute development to release cycles and and integrating security deeply into that process of release. And, and, and I look, those things are great and wonderful. And I believe that a company is better to have them. But I also believe that particularly in the sled market is not something we can all do or is practical. So, so then what can we do? And so that's where I always start. Innovation, what would Veeam do? Because I want to know what the, what the commercial market's doing. And that's, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the things we've tried to bring in, me, and my directors, we all came from the commercial market. And we said, well, what did we do there and how can we make it fit here? So my first point there, virtual Jason changed the game. It did for us. When I came to CSU, we were a much smaller school. It was 13 years ago. And we only had about eight physical servers. Now we have 12 to 15 virtual servers. We're running over 500, maybe 600 VMs at this point. Oh, why so many? Well, one of the reasons there's so many is we utilize a, a, a testing stack. And so you can see there, I've got a dev environment, a test environment, a staging environment, and a production environment. Each one serves a specific purpose. So you can see this is my version of a continuous, um, continuous deployment. Right. I don't I'm not using containers. Containers are not something we have adopted. I, I don't have the staff and I'm not fancy enough for that yet. But I tell you what I do have. I do have a development team and they have their own copy of the environment. 
and I have a test environment for my users to test the software, and I have a staging environment, and that environment is for no one but my staff, specifically my deployment and operations team to ensure that when, when a system is updated, that they know exactly what's going to happen. There are never any surprises when we go to production. And if there are, I expect an after action report explaining why what happened in staging didn't happen in production. And so, you know, I don't have a lot of tools that do that automated, but what I do have is, is staff that understand today why that's a priority. One of my, one of my staff members that I, that I lost recently, uh, you know, he was a manager for me. And so he's, he's been a bit, he'd been with us about six years. It's been about three years as a, as a sysadmin. And he actually handled our, our classroom learning system. Then he spent about three years as a manager. And when he left, he, he shared with me, he said, one of the things that I didn't really appreciate when I started here and I started working for you, it was really frustrating for me. You made me rebuild the environment over and over and over. And it took me a long time to understand how much simpler and more predictable our life becomes when we have a system like this, when we move software through a process. So, so I'm, I'm here to tell you, you know, the commercial guys, they have it right. Continuous integration deployment is the way to go. But if you can't afford the fancy tools, that doesn't mean you have to stop. Look, almost everyone here said that they're using VMware. You can do this today. And when you do it, the outcome, if you do it well for your own staff and your customers is, they will see less unexpected errors, less unexpected outages, less unexpected gaps when things roll out, and you will get a much better process out the door. So I'd highly recommend if you're not doing this today, think about it. This may not be the right set of stacks for you, but it is for us. And, and I'd be happy to share how we do that with, with any of you uh, at any point. It's, it's, it's oftentimes the thing that we have to break the most when, a, when an employee comes in. One of my most recent hires, uh, we actually had to, we dealt with this for about a year and a half on our operations team. He came in from a local government in a county in Florida. I won't, I won't call them out by name. And, and he said, you know, look, we don't, we don't have test environments. We have production. And so that's what he's used to. You make the change in production. And so it was a really hard change to get to, well, well what's broken? I don't know. I'm just going to keep changing things till we find out. No, that's, that's wholly unacceptable. We, we don't operate that way. We will know the system and we will know exactly what change took effect. And when you do that, again, your customer experience is going to be better because they're going to have an expected outcome. We've been running, you know, we don't, again, full disclosure, we don't run at five nines of uptime, but we do run at about four nines of uptime. And I, I think that's pretty good for a relatively small IT organization uh, who doesn't put um, a lot of automated tools in place on these things. So, you know, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I, I would hope most of us would be. So, you know, that, that's one part of this is, is how can we use virtualization, and bring that in and actually adopt implemented improved strategies there. Another one is DevSec and Ops is what I said, right? And so one of the things we do is we actually make sure that these teams spend time together. We do um, events together. We actually encourage them to get to know each other. And I know that could be challenging if you're at a college where you might have, or university, we have multiple colleges and each one has their own IT, or at a local agency possibly that has to share some resources with other agencies or other areas. But I want to encourage you to make sure that those teams work together. When they work together, you get the benefits of them communicating and coming up with solutions together. And so again, that's something that you don't often, you don't have some of these problems in the commercial sector where these, where these groups aren't so segregated in many cases. And the last one here. I'm going to try to pick up my pace because I think I've been a little slow, guys. I get excited about this topic. Uh, the last one there is reward innovation. And so uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, I spent eight months in Iraq. And I'll never forget, my captain made us go up on the roof every day and check the antennas, make them better. Three months in, I was frustrated. What am I supposed to make better today? It's the same as yesterday. But what I really took out of that it was, it was real hard there, but it's not hard today. I'm sure every one of you can think of something that isn't right in your environment. This, it's not perfect, but we had to do it that way. Okay, well, can you make it better today? And I push all my employees, what can we do that's better than we did yesterday? And if you do that, your, your customers will have a better experience without a question. So what's an example of that for me? Well, we actually... We actually re totally revamped our file share a year and a half ago, about two years ago now. And, and you know, it's a typical project, right? It's a boring IT project. We'll let people know the timeline and we'll move on. 
said, no, guys, that's not good enough. How are we going to get people excited about this? You want them to move their files. How are we going to do it? What's going to get their excitement levels up? And so one of the things we did, this was my IT team at the time. You can't really read their shirts. The picture's a little pixelated. I apologize. But, but what they say is the J drive is dead. Long live the S drive. So who came up with those shirts? Well, the team came up with those shirts. They came up with their slogan. We had a contest in IT and let them come up with the slogan that they felt was good for them. We made stress balls that had the logo on them. We passed them out to the whole company. We got the whole company hopefully excited about this process. We got shirts for the training coordinators in the company. We scheduled specific Fridays throughout that process that the whole team was going to wear those shirts to remind the company. And so these are my internal customers. Let's treat them like customers. Let's get them excited about what we're doing. Let's get them information. And so that's what we did. There's a couple comments in here that I totally agree. It's not... It's not too uncommon in education settings um, to get teams together, I think is what we're referring to, Alan, right? But um, <laughs> thank you. Good looking group. Uh, but we do, we do need to make sure we communicate well internally and with our staff and with our, of course, external total customer. So this is one way we do that, right? We want to make sure that we reward these ideas that they have. And we, I don't want to discourage these ideas of how can we get a slogan for this? How can we... How can we get people engaged? It's not marketing promotion doesn't just have to be for the marketing department. And in IT, when we do so many things that users don't want to hear, particularly around security, uh, the more we, be we can begin to put it in this context, the more we can get buy-in and excitement. So I want to encourage you to think that way. So we got one last topic that we're going to cover, and I think you'll know where I'm going with this, but it's who are you going to call? It's not the Ghostbusters, hopefully. It's hopefully your staff, right? How do we retain the staff we have? Got a couple of buzzwords here too. I don't want to look at them. I don't, I can't handle another employee telling me that, that they got a call yesterday for 30,000 more. I don't know if any of you had those. I've had them. It's been a painful conversation. And full disclosure, I struggled with this part of the conversation, even shared that with Sean ahead of time, because look, I, I'm dealing with this just like all you guys are. I've got employees leaving and I can't blame them. You know, it was a common refrain a few weeks ago at another event I attended. I actually heard everybody there was dealing with this. So, so if you're dealing with it, so is everyone else. And so, I, yep, Sean notes, yes, and we're in K-12 and we can't negotiate. And, and, and you know what? You know what I've found is that it, it almost doesn't matter at this point. There's so many remote jobs. People, people can go get a salary even if you could negotiate. I, I, one of the examples I heard was somebody who said, yeah, I got this developer. He's only got a year of experience and they're going to offer him double. I can't offer him that, but even if I could, I wouldn't. He's not worth it. Okay, there's somebody out there that wants your employee, one of your employees, if not more, more than you do, whether you can negotiate or not. And, but, but you're absolutely right, Danny. People do quit their manager and not their jobs. And so, well, what can we do about that? Well, the first one is 2020 vision, right? Where exactly does your employee want to go with their career? And where exactly are you going to take them? This is a conversation that I've staked my career on with my employees so it starts with extreme honesty right you got to be able to be honest with that employee and where can you take them right and and how can you help them meet their career goals all of us presumably went to school at some point for something whether it was to get a degree or to, to get a certification and they didn't pay us to do that or at least in most cases they didn't pay us to do that right we did it on our own and in many cases paid for that why because we understood there was a value on the back end right and so yeah, today the market's crazy, but those things still apply. I cannot tell you how many employees that we have at CSU that are here because I understand what they value and what they want to know and what they want to learn, and we put them in positions to continue to grow. And many of my best employees are people who have stayed and have stayed for years because, because they're still gaining more than they're missing by not taking that salary from somewhere else. And so that's huge. And I'm not talking about parties or better chairs or working remotely. I'm specifically talking about how can you grow in the knowledge in the field that you're in. My VMware expert or my, you know, my, my male guy that wants to learn VMware or wants to learn identity management. How can I partner with them and help them grow? How can I help the guy that's on the help desk that wants to be a security administrator? I loved a conversation I had last month with a guy who said, hey, uh, you know, I want to move into a security role. I just got a degree in it and I'm going to do that. And I'd like to do it here. But if I can't do it here, then I'm going to do it somewhere else. That's great. 
We, now we have an open dialogue. So what do we do with that employee? Well, he's begun to sit in on our calls. He's in a role that already works with security to, to be fair, but you know, he's begun to sit in our calls and we do our audits. Look, let's get you in on this. Let's get you some experience. And then I'm gonna move you into a role and I'm gonna help you be successful. I'm gonna show you what it takes. And then if you get a better job somewhere else, I'm gonna congratulate you and I'm gonna reward your success. And we're all gonna win. And we're going to win together. And it's going to be a little painful when I have to find someone to take your place. But look, if you work hard at this, you will attract good talent and people will tell others about you. And so that's the first step. I'll be, I'll be very quick here, Sean, I promise. A direct connection to the mission falls directly in line with that. It's not enough to actually just cover what, what oh my goodness, I, just, I, I messed that all up. I did, guys, I'm sorry. It's not enough to just connect that to what the employee wants. You gotta connect it to your mission, right? And so quick, simple example, just had a, con a conversation with our development, uh, admin, uh, senior developer, director of our development team. And I had to have a conversation about, look, we're, we're losing development staff and what are we gonna do? We can't replace them all, but we're gonna have to hire outside contractors. And it's not something he wants to do. No one wants to, right? But many of us do it. And I was able to share with him, look, I'm going out and I'm talking to other leaders. And I can tell you, if you want to go somewhere else, this is part of your job. They're going to expect you to be able to work with an external development team. So while this is painful for you, this is going to help you grow in your career. That's step one with the vision. Step two is we have to find a way to take a particular product we're referring to and move it to the cloud. That is critical to the, to the institution. And you can't do it. You don't have the staff. This is the effective way to do it. This is not only going to help the institution, it's going to help you grow. And point three there, display passionate growth. Well, how do you do that? Well, you, you got to demonstrate it, right? And so if you heard what I said there, I said, I'm talking to other leaders and I'm hearing that and I'm seeing it. I'm going out and growing myself, and I want you to do the same. How else do we do it? It doesn't, it doesn't have to be paying someone to go to a conference. It can be encouraging a lunch and learn and encouraging your employees to speak and present in front of other employees. We encourage our employees to do that. I encourage employees to present their own ideas to the institution. No, I don't want to go present to the leadership team. I want you to present to the leadership team. And so... I kind of rushed that last part there, guys. I didn't balance my time quite as well, so I apologize. But, but, but these things can help you keep employees and can help you gain employees. So that's what I have to say. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come back to a couple of these comments. Employees need to feel that they're not in a dead end job. Absolutely, Danny, and you're absolutely right. And, and the thing about that is it doesn't have to mean a promotion. It has to mean they're growing. These are IT people, right? They're like you and me. We got where we are because we wanna learn. We wanna engage, we wanna learn new things. Push them to do it and they'll, and they'll appreciate it. Continuous conversation is key, absolutely. Biggest compliment I've gotten in the last two years when I took over another project manager was, you know, I was sharing, speaking to another employee. I said, I, I hope she's happy because I'm pushing her hard and I'm letting her know what she's doing that isn't effective. And the response I got, and it's really stuck with me was, look, she is happy, not because she always likes what you say, but she knows where she stands with you. She knows what she's doing well and what she isn't. And, and I really took that and tried to remember that. That's important. Your employees need to know exactly what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. So do we, Sean, I'm going to turn this over to you uh, and see if we have any specific questions uh, from the group. Why don't we add the questions into the chat function right now? Perfect. I'm going to yeah, I think we got some good dialogue here. So, so absolutely. So I'm going to kind of read a couple more of these uh, while we're going. The continuous conversation is key. Absolutely, Wayne. I, you know, my favorite quote that I keep with me and I'm going to attribute it to Tom Herman, but I don't know if that's real. I can see lots of memes out on the internet. Nobody cares. Work harder. I, I carry that with me every day, not as an insult, but as, look, you know, my employees don't care if I had a, 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 a late night or if, you know, my daughter was, was, was crying last night because of a boy or any of those things, right? They only, it's not that they don't care about me. It's that they have real problems and they have real needs that they're bringing to me. And it's my job to meet their needs, right? And so, if I'm not doing that every day, if I'm waiting toward till a review to cover an issue we're having or a thing they're doing well, 
like that's a problem. That's a real problem. And I need to make that my focus every day. Every day, when you have an interaction with one of your employees, one of the things you should ask yourself is, how can I make this person better? What can I do to improve their experience and their knowledge and their capabilities? And if you do that, uh, you'll have a better customer experience because you'll have a staff that's continually growing and has a passion to do so. Yeah, and something that Danny put in the chat function, which I agree with, is you know people quit their managers, not their jobs. Um, you know, tying into what you're saying, they they absolutely do. They absolutely do. Alan, you asked, do do us do, do you and your manager use any performance reviews? We so we absolutely do. We do a couple things. So we do an annual review, which is obvious. You know, I think it's fairly common in most careers at this point, most companies. So we so we do that. I take the time to make sure that I fully flesh those out. I actually do it with the employees. I don't fill it out ahead of time. And the reason I don't do that is because I found that when you do that, what happens is the employee they generally won't ask you any questions. They just want to read it. So I actually fill it out while I'm talking to them and I explain why I'm putting in there what I am. And at any point, if I have to reference something that they don't already know because we haven't talked about, I immediately stop and I apologize. Look, you, this should not be a surprise to you when we get here. And so I, I meet weekly. My direct reports have, have four departments, five departments, if you include the group at Waldorf, that meet directly with me. So I meet with each one of them weekly. And weekly, we actually go through during that meeting what's going on, of course, but then we also take any time to cut, discuss any sort of performance or concerns there. I, I don't want to wait. I want it to be immediate. I don't want to get to the end of the year when I don't remember it and they don't remember it or I have to take some sort of notes specifically for their review. So, you know, uh, we have reasons to keep notes, but but uh, if it's about their performance, I want them to know immediately. And so we do that. And that's how that's how I do it, Alan, in addition to our annual performance reviews. And I work very hard to be fully transparent. Well, and Charles, thank you so much. I hate to cut the conversation short because I feel like we could keep on going for, for quite a while, but this has been you know, very enlightening. And Charles, once again, thank you so much for your time. This has been really wonderful. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it.